For the closing keynote, I have the pleasure to introduce Paul Romer. He's a professor at NY, uh, NYC, sorry, and is a co-recipient of a 2018 uh, Nobel Prize in Economic Science. And I'll leave the floor to you, Paul. Well, it's it's very exciting for me to, to be here. I've uh, this is my first uh, JupyterCon, and I think what Jupiter has accomplished, and then the Python community as well. But what uh, these open source projects have accomplished is really just astonishing to me. And I think there's also an enormous amount of potential going forward, and that's what I want to talk about today. Um, my work in economics has been focused around exploring a very simple idea, which is that uh, ideas are different from objects. Um, if I had a bottle with some solution that, had, that could uh, rehydrate a child who's become dehydrated, that bottle would have a value which doesn't change with the number of children um, nearby or in the world. But if I have a formula for something like oral rehydration therapy, that I can teach every family how to make this solution themselves in their, their homes, just materials from their kitchen, um, that formula has a value that scales linearly with the, the number of people or the number of children on Earth. And this changes everything about economics, mostly uh, for good, but uh, increasingly I think we're realizing also for, for bad. This, these scale effects mean that we're much more likely to have a single firm who takes over and dominates an entire market. And so all of our history of relying on competition is going to be uh, different from, uh, the history is gonna be different from what we're going to experience going forward. But the, what I wanna talk about today is the fact that the potential benefits that come from this are limited not just by discovery, but they're limited as well by our ability to share ideas. We think that once it's discovered, uh, to a first approximation, we often think once it's discovered, it's a kind of a non-event to, to share it. But in fact, it's really quite complicated to, to share ideas. I used a, kind of an expression like this to try and get my colleagues in economics to think about this, this question. So if something is in human capital H, it's in your neurons, you can't share something that's in neurons. It's gotta be codified in some kind of uh, language. And then the thing that you can copy and make many copies of is the codified form of the idea. And then there's a, a challenge uh, in decodifying it or decoding it, uh, getting it back into neurons because most ideas uh, have to be instantiated neurons to actually produce any value. We know now that there are some things that you can actually put right into a, a machine, but that's the, that's the exception. As I was getting ready for this talk, I, I thought about how I think ineffective this uh, kind of picture has been at communicating this idea. So I, I tried just improvising uh, a, a picture. I am not an artist, but um, you know, there's somebody who's got an idea and smiling and there's a critical step of getting it into, for our purposes, we can think of it as, as, as bits. Once it's in bits, it's trivial to copy it, but then you gotta decode it and get it back into the head of the person who, um, who could potentially use it. And the main point I wanna try and drive home is that we don't spend enough time in, the, in improving the quality of the codification. If you write something that's very valuable and thousands, maybe millions of people read it, if you spent years of effort to reduce by one minute the time it takes for all those other people to read and understand what you've written, that minute multiplied by, again, by the scale at which you're operating can be hugely important. So we almost surely under invest in clarity in our um, communication. This limits the spread of ideas, it limits, limits progress. Uh, I'll also try and argue that clarity is very important for sustaining trust as well. Uh, bad actors thrive uh, behind obscurity 
and vagueness. So the limiting, and the limiting processes, and I think we're all more aware of this now, the limiting processes in the spread of ideas and the utilization of ideas are both uh, a lack of clarity, a difficulty in understanding them, and increasingly uh, an erosion of trust uh, because so many uh, supposed ideas or purported ideas turn out to be uh, misleading and uh, damaging. So, with that as the, uh, the background, let me try and tell you a little bit about first how I got into this topic. I was asked to, um, to discuss or to, to review uh, for a journal a, a paper by some economists that looked like this. Now, don't be afraid. There won't be a test. You don't really have to understand this. But um, they assumed, in effect, that the distribution of productivity uh, amongst workers, which is indexed by X, and then over time indexed by T, was, uh, took this form. And there was some motivation for it, but the gist of it was they just assumed this. Then output would be an average uh, with respect to this distribution of uh, uh, worker uh, productivity. And um, what, they, what they said about it um, was that if you look very closely, you'll see that there's an alpha and a, a beta. These are two rate parameters. Alpha is the diffusion rate of an idea across, uh, across workers. Beta is the discovery rate. And as often uh, one does when you're dealing with complicated mathematical, mathematical expressions, you do, they did an asymptotic analysis where they said, if you take the limit as t goes to infinity, the growth rate converges to alpha, this 2%, and um, it's invariant to the beta rate. So discovery has no effect on the growth rate in this, in this model. Now, if you've been around the block, you, you know to be a little bit skeptical of one of these kind of provocative claims. Um, and at the time, I did not know Python. I did not know uh, Jupyter. I actually tried to use Mathematica to check my, my work on this. Uh, but here's, you know, here's, here's, in effect, what I would do today. Um, so first, um, SymPy has this amazing facility that I don't know if very many people know about. I'm defining some, just some variables I'm going to use, but I'm relabeling them. I'm not using the, the default names. Um, that means that if I want to have some, some expression like lambda, well, this first one will just depend on, on x. Um, oh, so I need to, need to do this. Um, SymPy produces for you this beautiful LaTeX that um, um, you know, shows you the equation. And um, it also translates the A and the B into the alpha and, and the beta. So um, you know, hats off to the, the people at, at SymPy. And notice, I can just write some functions that, uh, and compose the functions together and produce uh, this um, this expression that we, we saw on the, last, um, on the last slide. If you go back to the last slide and you look at the, um, the tech um, or the law tech, um, it's really horrible. I mean, it was, it was very hard to get this, uh, to get this right. But uh, with MPy, you just compose some functions and it, it just kind of just falls out. But, but even better, uh, when I need to calculate output, um, I need to take an integral with respect to this, this distribution. This distribution has a mass point at, at zero. So one of the first things I got to do is figure out, well, what's the limit of this distribution as, as x goes to, to zero? You can't ev evaluate it directly. You have to take the, uh, take the limit because it's, it's singular at, at, at zero. And uh, SymPy will do that for you, too. Um, so um, this, it tells me, OK, here's, here's your expression for the, for the limit. Now, then the really cool part is uh, to take a the, the average with respect to this distribution, I'm going to have to differentiate this expression uh, with, with respect to x. And just no way, um, no way I'm going to do that by hand. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, Simpy says, sure, yeah, I can do that. I can do that for you. Then uh, at this point, we need to do some numerical um, integration. So we can use SciPy and NumPy. And um, then uh, I can just put a, a, draw a graph, 
And you'll notice that uh, for this particular initial discovery rate, there's very, very little growth for a long time, and then eventually the growth rate picks up. Now let's, let's add another discovery rate, which is, um, which is lower. Um, and what that does is lower the, the curve down. And you know, as you can kind of imagine by now, that, that will continue for uh, any sequence of discovery rates. So the truth is that the discovery rate or the, or the growth rate in this economy is monotonically decreasing in the discovery rate. And it's only when you take the limit to infinity that you get this perverse uh, result that the, the growth rate goes to zero. So this was a, a case of academic, you know, I think borderline fraud. Uh, the authors, I discussed, I reviewed this paper, I told them what was going on. Um, they didn't correct it, the journal published it anyway. Uh, they're, they're, they're big shots, so um, you know, they could do that. But um, the paper write-up I, I eventually uh, produced on this, I don't think was as effective as it would have been if I could just send this Jupyter notebook to somebody and just say, look, just run the notebook. So um, I think I had trouble communicating um, the essence of what was, uh, what was going on. And by the way, the, the thing that you can do mathematically is um, just point out that um, if you take the limit as time goes to infinity and then uh, look at changes with beta, it's invariant to beta. But if you take the limit as beta goes to zero first, the growth rate goes to zero. And that's actually true you know, for every, um, for every uh, date t. So any time in mathematics where the order of the limits makes a difference in the result, you know that the limits don't mean anything. And uh, I could convince people of that, but it would have been far more effective if they could have just looked at the graphs. So that's uh, one story. Um, let me tell you about another thing I was involved in just, just recently. Um, I've been watching, like many people in the United States, the, the inflation rate. And um, in, uh, in the early part of this year, I think roughly February, the, the government provided a new set of estimates for seasonally adjusted um, monthly inflation. The, se the new estimates are the, the dotted line here. The old estimates are the, are the uh, magenta li line. And you know, this is a surprisingly big change in seasonal adjustments. You wouldn't ordinarily think that you know, just a small uh, revision to the seasonal adjustments would change things, and especially change the conclusion, because the dotted uh, orange line looks like it's decreasing, like we were making progress and in reducing inflation over the, over the course of 2022. The magenta line looks a lot more like just fluctuations around a, a, a stable point. So I got worried uh, that if the a, you know, a revision in the seasonal adjustments makes that much difference in the seasonally adjusted data, we should probably be looking at the unadjusted data. So um, let me just switch to that. Here's what the unadjusted data looked like for um, 2022. And again, this sort of decreasing trend is, is evident. If I go back um, one year, and um, look at it, you can see that you know, we were in a period where it looks like there was a trend that was going upward. Um, now, what I thought was helpful is that if you can't trust the seasonal adjustments, and if you wanna know if inflation's coming down, one thing you can do is compare the same months in different, in different years, because if there's a kind of a seasonal effect, you just, you just compare like with, with like. So um, let me uh, go back here and then show you um, two months on the same graph. Now, this, this, the pattern starts to look a little bit more um, ambiguous when you look at it, the, the two superimposed. I put in a gray arrow here just to kind of indicate that what's going on is this graph is wrapping. You know, it's a one year from December to December and then another year from December to December. So this end point, the December for the previous year is also the December at the beginning of the, of the new year. But, um, what we really want to do is look and see how is this changing from month to month. Um, what I was writing about was that inflation was substantially lower in the last quarter of 2022. Um, you know, September, October, November, December, and and surprisingly low. I mean, down around two percent, which is usually the the target. And I was worried that the Fed was continuing to raise interest rates at a time when we maybe had made more progress than we realized with uh, 
uh, uh, reducing inflation. And that was partly because people tended to look at 12-month averages, and that obscured what was going on in the near term. Okay, but so then we want to watch this from one month to the next. So here's when you bring back in the January data. And then it's not so clear. Um, this year, the solid line is well below the, dotted, the dashed line uh, at the end of last year. If you go into January, they're, they're getting closer again. Uh, you go to February, um, it's, uh, they're closer uh, still. You go into March, um, it, they actually uh, flip around. So uh, following the data in, in real time, watching as they updated, you know, my conclusion was that it may have been that the inflation rate was genuinely lower at the end of the year, but if so, it's, it's picked back up. Or um, it might be that uh, these were just random fluctuations and uh, it was just a mistake to pay too much attention to those. But the point, um, and by the way, um, I'm, I'm waiting, but today actually is when um, they'll release the, the newest uh, figure for, um, uh, for April. So I'll, and you know, there's an API, I can just run the API, get the new data. So I'll get the new data point. You can ask me at lunch if, how it turned out. But the, I wrote about the, the, the issues here. How can we make inferences in real time about what the inflation rate is, given that there's seasonals and, and noise? Um, I don't think that my written blog posts, which I, you know, I cut and paste these graphs into the blog list, I don't think those were as effective as, um, as it would have been if I could have given this, uh, this notebook to someone and just said, look, go through the graphs, just look at this, see what's, see what's going on, and be careful about seasonal adjustment. Uh, there are big seasonal effects, it looks like, and, uh, um, and they, can, they could potentially bias some of our inferences. So these are two cases where I think if the default platform, the default file format for communicating results were a Jupyter notebook, we could communicate uh, much more effectively. We could uncover uh, math that I think was misleading. We could see it, understand it much better. We could look at data much more clearly. And, and by the way, I, I really resonated with something um, that Fernando said yesterday from his, uh, his paper on this, that you're, you're often trying to tell a story with data. I don't think that the, the big issue in data visualization is just like adding some tools to let somebody explore the data. You know, we have lots of ways we can explore the data, but what you want are tools that let you uh, tell an effective story um, to someone. And having the same graphs in the same physical location and just seeing them change I think is, is much, more, uh, much more effective. Okay, so now um, let me try and do something that is probably a mistake, but what the heck. Uh, let me try and explain to you something that I find very complicated, but I think is actually very important as we grapple with this question of trust, which is how we can use uh, uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptography to create things like digital signatures on our artifacts, including our, our notebooks. I'm gonna try and persuade you, uh, if, you've, if you've tried to sort this area out, and I'm sure at least some of you have, uh, or you go try and read the available materials on this, you'll find it's very hard to, to follow. I think we can actually explain it more clearly, and I'm gonna try and do that, um, do that now. So um, uh, let me um, uh, do, start with this. So, um, a, a, an elliptic curve is just a curve in uh, a kind of a generalization of the plane. It's like in R2, except you're looking at the cross product of integers. So you've got a, integers that are of size uh, zero up to uh, Q minus one, where Q is some prime. And so in kind of the, the integer points in the plane, you've got a, a, a curve that uh, uh, defines pairs and uh, it's the points on that curve that we'll be, we'll be working with. That curve has a base, which is uh, also called a generator. So if you start with the base and then you uh, add, add the base to itself, you get another point on the curve. If you add that point to itself, you get another point on the curve. And so you can cycle through all the points on the curve just by increasing uh, the base or the, the, the generator. But you have to do this uh, two to the power 252 times to get all the way through the cycle. 
So um, it's the big numbers that, that let you hide things with, uh, with cryptography. So um, now there's, a, there's a, a part of this process that starts with a, a secret seed. So if you're going to get a, 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 if you wanted to sign a, a document, you'd start with a seed, which is a bit string. And I'm going to use Greek letters to signal bit strings here. Once you've got a bit string, though, you turn it into an integer. And you'd use a hash uh, function to do that. Uh, then you, there's a clamping process. Um, I'll come back and say something more about this. But this has to do with setting some bits to 0 because um, there's a, what's known as a cofactor of 8 in this generator. So we don't want to look at the things that are in this group where the cycle can run around from 0 back to 0 in just 8 additions. We want to look at the other one where you have to do it L times. But we have to avoid getting uh, points that are part of this small group uh, on the curve. So if you clamp three bits, you make sure that you always have something which is the first three bits, at least significant bits. You've got something which is always multiple, a multiple of eight. Um, then there's a process that we often take for granted, but I think it's worth writing it down formally. There's a function that we use to decode a bunch of bits and get, um, get an integer. And how you do it matters. They, this is the convention is to use the little endian um, formation. But so you compose these things all together. And uh, so you take the hash. You take only half of the, the result, uh, the output from the hash. You clamp some of the bits. You turn it into an integer. And then you use that integer. And then at this point, I always have to stop and think, well, wait a minute. This is all modular arithmetic. But wait, what's the, what's the modulus I'm going to be using here? Um, now, um, this, is the, this is the kind of formula you use. If you have a, a, a pair in this, this plane, in effect, of, of integers, um, x and y, uh, you can add points together. You can add a point to itself. That's known as point doubling. There's a, a, there's a formula that you can use to take the x and the y from the existing point and calculate the coordinates for the, the doubled point. This is uh, an example. This is actually the base that you, you start with. So they're just big, long integers. You apply this, this formula, and um, then you can calculate um, the, new, the new point. So at this point, when I was trying to work through all of this stuff, I'm thinking, OK, we're, I want to go look and see where are those three bits. And yeah, I'm not even, I always have to stop and think little endian. Am I looking at the end of this string or the beginning of this string? But it doesn't matter. Either one, uh, I'm, not, I'm not getting three, you know, three, three zeros in a row. So it's like, well, wait a minute. What, what was this whole thing about clamping the, you know, clamping the bits and getting rid of this factor of eight? Well. Um, it turns out that the clamping has to do with the bit representation for this multiple, the scalar, the multiple that multiplies b. And b times 1 or, or times 2 or 4 or 8 um, can, is their points in the plane. You're not dealing with uh, parceling out these factors of 8. It's this thing. It's the thing that multiplies b which has to have the, the first three bits uh, parceled out. And this is drawn from that space Q. So I should really be taking the mod uh, with respect to, to Q instead of with respect to um, P, um, instead of respect to, uh, no, I misstated. You should be taking the mod with respect to L, which is the length of the, uh, uh, the group that uh, exists on the, on the curve. It's mod L, not mod Q. But what, what's the point here? You know, you might, you're probably not following the math. But what I was doing is a form, a process that I would call test-driven theory. I was trying to understand the theory. I was writing down the equations. But I need to test my understanding. And so I thought, OK, I, I think I'm going to be seeing these clamped bits in the coordinates, uh, the x, y coordinates. I don't see them there, and I realize, OK, it's not that. It's actually in the bit representation for this scalar multiple. Um, so let me, let me keep going. There's a, um, there's a thing called, well, there's a public point. If you've got a secret, uh, uh, um, uh, a secret seed, 
you turn it into a secret scalar, S, then you multiply your, the base point times S, and you have a point, which really should be called the public point. There's something else that you could call the public key, which is where you take a point which is in this space of x and y coordinates. There's a way to encode uh, the public point into just one instance of the zq. Even though it's in the, the plane, it's, it really takes a pair. It's a one-dimensional curve in the plane, so you can actually encode it back down into something which is just, it just takes 256 bits to, um, uh, to encode. But um, the, the, the point I wanna try and make here is that there's, there's now, there's a secret seed, which is floating around here, which is a bit string. There's a secret scalar, which is an integer, which you calculate based on that, that bit string. And then from the scalar, you calculate a point. And then from the point, you can calculate another uh, bit string. But none of these things are the same as each other. And if somebody tells you we've got a secret key and a public key, you think, okay, a key is a thing. They're, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. These things are not the same at all. And the seed in particular is very different from, uh, as, uh, just as a random uh, string of bits, is very different than the, uh, the public key. And if you read in the, you know, the discussion uh, on the GitHub sites for you know, like Pi NACL, for example, you'll see that there's a lot of confusion about um, the difference between the secret seed versus this integer S that you calculate from the secret seed. So I think there's room to explain these, these things more, more clearly. Now, um, uh, let me try and persist. Even though this seems vague, let me try and persuade you you can understand one of the important things about digital signatures um, if it's just presented clearly. So now notice um, I'm using boldface to represent points in the plane. I'm using regular face to indicate scalars. You can't multiply points by points. You don't know how to multiply an xy pair times another xy pair. You can multiply a scalar times a, a pair. So every equation should look something like points are equal to scalars times points plus scalars times points. Um, when you need to sign a document, the first thing you do, uh, the old way to do it was you just picked a random um, integer z. Maybe you pick a random bit string and then turn it into an integer. You multiply the base times that. Then, um, then you uh, take the message, which is a bit string. You uh, concatenate the message with the, the point encoding of the public key or the public point. So this is really the public key here. Then you've got a, a bit string encoding of the R that you just calculated a minute ago. You uh, concatenate those things together. You hash it. You turn it back into a, an integer. And then you've got some integer, and you create this uh, expression z, which is your r, which is an integer, plus i, which is an integer, multiplied by s, which is your, your secret scalar. So what you send as the signature to someone is the bit in, encoded version of the boldface r, not, not the scalar r, and then the bit encoding of uh, this uh, this element z, which is just uh, from the, the, set of, the set of integers. Now, now here's where the magic comes in. If you have this expression, just z equals r plus i times f, if you multiply through uh, by the base, this is no longer an expression in integers. This is an expression in points on the elliptical curve, and um, then little uh, the integer r turns into the point r on the curve. s times b turns into um, your public point. And so you've taken something where you have a secret scalar, and you can, only you can create z. Just by multiplying through by b, you create something where everything in this expression is public. So anybody who receives your message can calculate this integer i from um, your public uh, point, your public key, and from R, because they, get, they get sent R in, in, the, in the signature. You've got R again. Um, they're also sent uh, Z in the signature. So the, anybody in the public has everything they need to know. 
And it's just this one transformation multiplying by b, where multiplying means just do this uh, addition of points or doubling of points over and over again on this, this curve. So you take something that's secret, you can turn it into something that has, in a, sec in a sense, the same information, but where nobody can infer the secret. And what R is doing here, remember, I is something that they can calculate. So what R is doing is helping you obfuscate your, your secret S. If you didn't have the R there, they could just, uh, if you sent them, you know, Z is I times S, they could just divide, uh, divide out the I and they'd have your, your secret. So the R's, the R's important here. Um, this is the uh, expression of this equation that I just did a cut and paste from uh, the Wikipedia page on, on this, uh, this algorithm. And um, I, I think the Wikipedia page is very good. I found it very helpful. But when I look at this version of the equation, I don't know how to process it. Uh, you know, there's, there's capital letters, there's some lowercase letters. I don't know what capital means. I don't know what lowercase means. I don't know what's a bit. I don't know what's a, an integer. I don't know what scalar multiplication. I don't know if the equation even makes sense. And I think, I think there's a way to rewrite things with the notation uh, that mathematics give us, gives us that makes this much simpler. So this equation at the bottom is the same as, as this one here. I'm using Z in place of what they used as, as S. But so attention to just something like notation. And if you were here yesterday when uh, you heard me ask about the support for LaTeX and MathJax in Jupyter, I think the power of the built-in math uh, kind of notation really vastly expands our ability to communicate sophisticated ideas. And especially this ability to combine both mathematical notation and a calculation, like, well, let me just look at some of those, those base points. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be sure and you know, make sure that we, we support uh, math checks uh, well. Let me just show you one other thing that I think you can understand, you know, even if you're a little unsure about some of these details. Um, remember, I said you used to just pick R at random. Um, what happens if you reuse R? So you've got um, Z, which is a function of the, the message, is equal to R plus I, which depends on pi is the bit string. Uh, remember, Greek letters are bit strings, so pi is the bit string that corresponds to P, which is your public um, point or your public key. Uh, rho is the same thing for R. Um, but um, if, you, um, if you take two different messages, but you use the same R, then you send somebody two different values of Z and two different values of I that they can, they can calculate from Z, then they can just do division, uh, just divide the difference between the two Zs by the difference between the two Is, and they can recover your, your secret scalar. So, and there were, you know, there were real uh, hacks, I think one of the PlayStations or something, they reused the nonce and uh, it basically disclosed the, the secret key. So the, the new way of doing this is one where you calculate the nonce, the R, from the data, from the, um, the, the message. So the, the details don't really matter, but you, you create some bits out of your, your secret uh, bit string. Uh, by the way, I'm borrowing the Python notation for slicing because mathematics doesn't have as, something as, as cool as slicing. So, um, so you take a hash of this, um, this thing that is, uh, is already a hash of your, your secret uh, seed, um, then um, you can concatenate it with the message and uh, turn that into an integer and that, that gives you your, your R. So R is now a function of, of mu. So I'm gonna abuse the notation here, just overload it and use R as both the number or but this function that depends on your secret seed and your, and your message. And I again is this thing that's public because it's gonna depend on um, the R, the bit encoding of the R, the, um, your public key and the message, which anybody observes. And with this setup, um, mu, if mu and mu primes, you've got two different messages, then you have to have two different R's. So you can never screw up and use the same nonce with the same message. So this is what they call deterministic um, signatures. This also uses, a, uh, the, the, the most common instantiation of this now is um, ED25519, which is, uh, uh, was developed independently, not through the government, uh, but it's what everybody now, now trusts. Um, but it uses this deterministic method for calculating um, signatures. 
Now, there's, there's, one, there's always a wrinkle here. There's something known as a fault attack, where if you can make a computer make a mistake, you can cause some trouble. So suppose uh, on my computer, I calculate an R for some message, and I got my secret sigma. Then I calculate Z uh, based, on, based on that R, and I send off the signature with R bold being the, the point, uh, and Z. Then suppose I try and sign that same message again. But, you know, for some reason, I need to sign it uh, uh, over. Uh, and it's all automated, so I'm not paying attention to what happens. If I calculate the new R, and then the attacker can flip a bit in the message with something like, uh, say, a row hammer attack uh, on, a, uh, on a virtual machine, then with a different um, message, I'm going to use the same R and a different message, I'm going to send these out, and the attacker has got my secret key again. So there's now a, a quite a bit of interest in how do we protect against this kind of uh, fault attack, which is not, it's not very likely, but it's not at all uh, impossible. That, and the loss of your secret key is, is, a, big, is a big deal. Um, now, again, let me emphasize the value of having the code and the, the math here. The, I said before that you could calculate this S by just dividing Z0 minus Z1 uh, by, oh, this is, uh, I knew there'd be a mistake. I changed H into I, um, but this should, the H's should be I's. So, uh, in any case, um, the whole point of cryptography is there are things that are possible mathematically, but they take so long that they're just, you know, they're irrelevant. So it wasn't obvious to me that you can actually do this division where you're trying to divide um, a number with you know, about 70, 80 uh, digits by another integer, which has got 70, 80 digits. So you're doing division in um, modular arithmetic with integers that are like 70 uh, uh, bits long. So I, I tried to read about what's the algorithm for doing division in a case like this. So I, I said, let's just, um, let's just pick um, Q by the way, they call it uh, ED25519 because the prime is 2 to the power 255 minus 19. Um, but so I just, here's Q, and then um, I pick a, just a random uh, digit uh, integer that's less than Q. Um, God bless uh, uh, fo format strings. You can use these so things even line up, and you can you know, right align them and see that it really is smaller. Um, then there's this program for calculating a modular inverse of a number like A when P, the prime, is, um, is Q in this case. And um, it, you know, it's, like, it's that quick. I, you, don't even need, you don't need any special libraries to do this. I, you know, I wrote the algorithm out, but it's just really pretty simple. Now, if I check the inverse, um, um, That wasn't supposed to work. Oh, oh I, I, again, that's my, my fault. I was supposed to do this. I was going to say, look, if I take A times B, if B is really the inverse of A, do I get back 1? And they're like, uh, no, I don't get back 1. But um, I'm supposed to show you that first. But remember, this is all modular arithmetic. So, um, so if you do um, mod Q, then um, uh, Oh yeah, thank you. My, my rule used to be I never did arithmetic at the blackboard, now it should be, I should never type in a presentation, but anyway. Okay, so it really develops, it really gives you back, uh, back one. And now the last thing, I, just because I thought it was so pretty, um, this algorithm is like a form of long division, and you just kind of calculate some residuals, and each step the residuals get smaller. So I just decided to print out the residuals, um, have an option to do that. And I, I just thought it was beautiful to just watch how you start with one of these huge numbers, and it just kind of does this whole series of uh, kind of steps where you're calculating a re residual each step. And after about oh, 150 or so uh, iterations, you get, you, you get to uh, the, the, the value for your, your inverse. So I hope I've persuaded you that um, mathematical notation, if we use it seriously, can help us understand. And by the way, what was I doing with the alphas and the bold? It was type hinting. Okay? I mean, it's a different type when you've got a, a bit 
or you've got a, an integer, or you've got points, uh, which are pairs of, of integers, and we can use the notation to kind of remind us about the types. So if you use the notation and you combine it with something like test-driven um, analysis of your, of your math, I think we can explain difficult concepts um, with, with much, uh, much greater success. So this, I think, is what the research paper of the future should, should look like. It should blend words and mathematics. We've been doing that for a couple centuries. We've got a whole bunch of tooling to, to blend words and mathematics. But, um, and then we're also pretty good now at including th something like graphs in, in with a document as well. But now you've got to have code, and you've got to be able to run the code. And so forget about the PDF. The future has got to be something like um, um, uh, Jupiter. So, so how do we get there? Um, if I told you that this is really the way, the way we should go, how do we get to that, that future? Um, w one of the things, I, I have in mind somebody who's, say, um, uh, uh, like a, a woman from Colombia now, actually having thought about uh, Fernando's story, a woman from Colombia who's in a sociology program, who's gonna write her PhD thesis, she's got a bunch of data she's analyzed, and I'm trying to persuade her to write your PhD in a, in a Jupyter notebook. And she's never even used the terminal. So I like to give her something where she can use Jupyter but never have to touch the, the terminal. She's smart, she could figure out the terminal, that's not a big deal. But the people she wants to read her paper are probably not gonna figure out how to use Jupyter if they have to use the terminal. And I don't wanna like, you know, send her down a blind alley where she's got a thesis that nobody's gonna read. So how do we make sure that um, Jupiter is just available to her and say her older, her older colleagues? So, so part of it is you know, what we already know how to do with um, Jupyter Desktop. I, I wrote my own version of, of Jupyter Desktop um, just because I didn't want to use Electron and I want to use the standard Python distribution. But, but we, know, we know how to do this. I, I wasn't going to do this live because the way it works is it installs Python first and then it downloads uh, you know, from um, PyPI uh, Jupyter and, and installs it. And so it's a, it's a long, long download. So it's a kind of a slow, um, a slow install. But, um, but this, is, this is straightforward. We know how to do this. Once it's, uh, once it's installed, um, what I think we need as well is some kind of a GUI interface that will actually hide the complexity of virtual environments from somebody who doesn't want to necessarily know, at least in the beginning. So if this woman's paper gets sent out, it's going to have to have a requirements.txt file, and it'll have to be in its own uh, virtual environment on somebody's machine. But um, you know, they should be able to pick um, some kind of an area, like, like readings, some kind of a project. So like that symbolic math thing I was showing you is, is one project here. But, but let, me, let me show you first um, um, the, the kind of the quick start that this kind, of, um, this kind of tooling can offer. Now, what's happening at the moment is I'm now opening up my default browser, which is, which is Firefox. So um, before I was showing you some things in the, the app version of, of, of Google, but now I'm just back to regular old Firefox. Um, uh, there's, you know, there's some explanation. You've got to kind of tell people what's, what's going on. Um, you'll notice I like certain kind of formatting decisions, like a, a serif font and, you know, not too long a line length. And so I've got, you know, a style that, that does, that, um, does that for me. But um, in, the, in the setup document or the startup document, the first thing, the first thing you're going to do besides format the document is generate, um, a, generate a, a secret key. So um, boom, you generate a secret key. And then if you're on a, um, if you're on a Mac, um, what you can do is go look at um, Keychain. Um, and in, in your login folder, there's, um, you know, there's an ED25519 secret key. But the story about asymmetric uh, in encryption is it's basically a tool for turning every other problem into a key management problem. And key management is actually a really hard problem. If your software automatically moves the keys into something like um, your, your keychain, um, it's gonna be much easier for people. They don't, they don't even have to, they never copy and paste it, never look at it in, a, in an editor, but um, 
it'll just be there, and then you can also get it from the keychain anytime you want to sign. So let's um, go ahead and just take a string. Um, then um, I'm going to write that string to a file. If, uh, if I've done that right, okay, that file is now there. Um, now I can sign it, um, which will produce uh, another file with a, a different extension, which will show up in a second. Um, oh, no, I haven't, uh, I didn't do the signing. So, um, so now we'll, we'll see the, the file in a second. Now let's, let's look at this file in, in the, the editor. So, um, so it's just the string that I sent it. There's a signature at the top, which is like, remember that was that R and the Z or the bit versions of that. So the signature is uh, um, 512 uh, bytes. The public key that you'd use to, to verify it is, is a half of that. And then I, I think it's a good idea to actually put some null bytes into a message like this because if you run this through as just pure text, um, uh, and the, the box will be interpreted as Unicode as text. There are, there are programs like uh, uh, Git, which will do things like add and remove uh, the, the line endings when you move between, say, a Windows and a Mac, and um, that will break the signature. You change the, the line endings, the signed document won't verify. So uh, Git will treat this as a binary instead of as a, a text file, even if everything else is text. The point I wanted to make here is that I think the Jupyter Lab environment, I don't use Jupyter Lab as a, an IDE. I think it's wrong to describe it as an IDE. I use it a lot, but I use other, other tools as well, like you know, Visual Studio Code. But what Jupyter Lab does do is it gives a unified framework where I could explain to anybody, whether they're on a Windows machine or a Mac, how to produce a file, Write, uh, write that file, sign it, and then go in an editor and, and look at it. And for that matter, you, know, you could also go into the terminal and uh, you know, uh, look in the terminal. We, we'll, we ship uh, Git Bash along with Windows, so you'll have a, you know, a kind of a Bash-like terminal that you can use. I think for explaining uh, to people what's going on in their, their computer, to have the same experience on both operating systems in terms of a terminal, um, uh, and Python and, and Jupyter, I, I, and plus the, plus the editor, I, I think this is just far better than all of these things where you gotta read one set of instructions, do this to under, look at this file on the Mac, do this to do it on Windows. I think Jupyter has you know, really powerful pedagogical advantages and just learning reading advantages relative to, just, uh, Jupyter Lab does, relative to, to Jupyter Notebook. Um, I uh, just one other, I guess one other thing um, I want to I want to show. Um, using signatures is a little bit complicated. Uh, suppose I've got some some signed messages here, um, and suppose I just pull them to a to a file, and then um, we go back to a, a notebook. Um, oh, here, um, I need to get another environment. Um, signatures. Um, if you try to authenticate these messages, um, there, there are actually a lot of things that can, can come up. Um, so um, so if, you, if I just go check, see are there any files in that you know, to check folder, here, here's the kind of thing that can happen. So you get a message from me that's my, you know, my hello world uh, text, and the, the signature verification checks, that's just a piece of math. But the code has got to also take my public key and go off and verify who is that public key associated with. So there's got to be a website that says, oh yeah, that public key is actually uh, associated with this person, Paul Romer, who lives in New York and affiliated with NYU. And so there's got to be a, a website where somebody verifies and, and kind of publishes these uh, public keys. So. It gets that information, it says the checks are passed, but then the user has to think about something like, well, do I wanna just uh, move this to authenticated or do I wanna add this person to say trusted senders? So that happens automatically in the background. Um, here's another person um, 
where it's not entrusted. If I run this again, I can put myself entrusted. You'll, you'll see the difference. But there's other things that can happen. I mean, the signature could be invalid. Somebody could have just modified the document. They could have tried to fake the signature. Uh, it could also be that it was signed with a valid key and the signature is valid, but that key has been uh, made inactive. Keys get exposed all the time. People will have to be able to uh, like, uh, put their keys out of uh, being active, replace them with a, with a new key. It's no big deal if you lose a key, you just get a new one, but you gotta check with this website. And then somebody who gets a message that this key is inactive has gotta think about, okay, well, wait a minute, what should I do? It's, uh, you can't really trust this signature, but, um, uh, and it could even be somebody who's in your trusted file but um, the key has now been marked as inactive. So there's actually a number of possible responses you can get, and you need to think a little bit about what they mean in terms of deciding, am I actually gonna run something which can run unrestricted code from that person and do anything they want on my, on my operating system? And I think that signatures and this supporting system of um, the public key distribution uh, website I think signatures are the only way to go um, to, uh, to be secure going forward. I mean, we've, we've tried like virus check, you know, checking kind of, uh, and it's just never worked. And it's not gonna work in something like a notebook where people can write um, arbitrary code. But you know, ever since the Pleistocene, we've, as humans, have gotten good at tracking reputations of people we deal with knowing some people are reliable, they just make mistakes, unreliable, they make mistakes, sometimes they're bad actors, but there are other people who are relatively trustworthy, and we learn how to tell who to trust and who not to trust, but that only works, reputations are possible only if you know who you're, you're dealing with, and we need to bring all of those mechanisms back to the, the world of digital, um, digital communication. You know, as you're aware, that this issue of trust and authentication is a huge problem in all of our digital media right now. I think this kind of approach can scale beyond just academics trading research papers, but you know, let's go uh, one, one step at a time. So to conclude, the, the kind of the design goals I set for myself um, when I started thinking about this um, uh, two or three years ago were one, um, it's, you gotta be able to do everything without touching the terminal it's gotta be at least as safe as a, as a PDF if I'm gonna get people to, uh, to use it. Now that's not a very high bar, to be honest, but you know, still, PDFs are what they're using, so uh, I think I'm okay on that. And it's gotta be easy. It's gotta be so easy that that woman thinking about writing her thesis is confident that if somebody else wants to read her thesis, all they have to do is just click uh, to download some installer, install it on their machine, and then uh, they, they, read, they, they read her thesis. And it's in that installer, that thing can't, it can't mess up your path, it can't mess up some other version of Python you've got installed, uh, it can't interfere with your future uh, installs of Python, but you know, that, that's, that's doable. So uh, that's the future, and uh, I, hope, uh, I hope I can persuade more people to, to help uh, push this forward. I've been thinking about this as just a wrapper that builds on what Jupyter offers. If, if people decide that this could become a part of the kind of the Jupiter family, that's great. But I think, you know, either way, uh, um, there's, a, there's a real potential for us to do something that could be important for dealing with clarity and taking seriously the, the challenge of restoring trust in our communication of ideas. Thank you. We have time for one question. Okay, Alisa, yep. run upstairs. Thank you, that was very, very enlightening. And I'm, I'm someone who agrees with you completely about this is how we should publish. I have been asked a question which I will obnoxiously also ask you, uh, which is, what about the future? And so when we um, uh, 
have, have published ideas about this, we're always saying, well, but then there also has to be some printable version, some yeah. PDF, some archival version, because we know what will happen 20 or 30 years from now. Yeah. And so that's the obnoxious question I'm asking you, and I'm yeah. sorry in advance. Um, I, I actually, um, <laughs> one other nonprofit that I actually believe in or not for profit, which is New York Public Library, and so I'm on their board of trustees. They're very serious about this issue of archiving, um, but they think that the, the solution is we just gotta archive uh, digital media and know how to be able to read them. So they think that part of the role of research libraries is that you have to save generations of all of the software so that you can um, go back and rerun. And the, the, the good thing about Jupyter is that everything is really kind of, we can document which versions of all the libraries, which version of Jupyter you were running. We will have to have some kind of you know, documented version of the operating system. But with virtual machines, you know, we could spin up any operating system you want. I think the solution is we just get good at, at doing archiving um, digitally. So. But it's a, it's a good question to ask, and it's a, it's a serious issue. Um, OK, we'll take one more question. Can, can I pass this way, please? <laughs> Can I and I guess the other part of it, too, while we're finishing, is, is that there's no way we're going to be able to archive the experience of like test-driven theorizing, where you run the code to see, was I right about what I was going to see? You can't archive that and so um, on paper. So let's, let's find a better way to archive it. Thank you for your talk. It was, it was wonderful. Um, thinking about like reproducible science, and uh, uh, spinning these things up on, on computers. I know BinderHub has been working a lot on this and doing it in the cloud. Uh, we've been working on it at GitHub. Um, having these recreatable environments on the fly and going is, is great. Um, but I think limiting it to a single computer maybe isn't uh, where we want to be headed, but instead like collaborating online. Um, and then also like thinking about how not only that collaboration, um, but how, what I would call code review, but like uh, peer review would happen in the scientific community and moving more of those things online. Yeah. And then to the point about archiving, like one thing we've been doing at GitHub is uh, we do have our Arctic Code Vault, uh, which is in the global seed bank um, in, in the North Pole. So we've been putting some of these things there as well. Yep. Um, and I think looking at uh, knowledge and information as you know, like a human asset that needs to be stored in the same way as, you know, our ability to recreate our food supply is yeah. um, something that maybe we can't just do with paper. Yeah. Well, on the, the first part of your question, um, I, I think it's important that we agree that it's possible to run just plain vanilla Python from python.org, plain Jupyter, and get it on anybody's computer, including the older colleagues of this woman who wants to write her thesis. If that's doable, then we are free to ask, OK, is that the best way to do it? Or would it be better to use you know, um, Jupyter Hub or you know, some other kind of mixed or hybrid uh, solution? My concern right now is, is that it's not doable to just make sure people can run Jupyter on their local computer. And so we kind of do all of these workarounds, like, like Jupyter Book, where we give up on the, the real um, interactivity. So let's first just make it uh, doable locally, and then we'll see where, uh, where we want to use the cloud and where we don't. I do think that we're going to actually decide that if you're storing and creating a secret key, you, you want to do that on your machine. You don't want to do that on a cloud machine. You don't want to do it, I don't think, in the browser. And you don't want to do it in something that's, that's running on Electron. You know, you've got to be very serious about the security risks, I think, if you're going to start, you know, supporting something like, like signatures. So I think this is feasible. I think this is an addition to a wonderfully rich kind of uh, 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 set of uh, activities. And uh, uh, it's, good, it's good to pursue them all. But I, I think this will add something. So. One last question. Um, Thank you so much for the talk. Um, when it comes to sharing, the IPYNB format is how we've been sharing it since you know 2013, whatever. And a couple of years ago, one of the large companies who will remain nameless for the moment were very vocal about wanting to split that format into multiple files 
so dot .py and plus whatever. And how do you think we continue in the sciences to have a notebook format that becomes the standard and doesn't get diluted by other interests. Yeah. Look, we've been to this rodeo before, you know. Um, I, if you're as you're old as I am, you remember, you know, when Word first came in and the PDF came in. We gave away control of our basic file formats to for-profit firms that pursued their own interests and created ridiculous security vulnerabilities in our basic file formats to provide functionality that we didn't want. So we need to not let that happen this time. I think the, uh, the existing notebook format is terrific. And just say no when somebody wants to, you know, to fork it or, or undermine it or abuse it. And, uh, but as a community, we got to run hard and fast to make this. And I, I mean, it's got to be available to everybody. Um, and if it's not, um, I think we're going to lose that. We're going to lose that fight again. We're going to get stuck with a, you know, an updated version of, of, of Adobe. And, and you know, there's a, there's a long way we need to go here. You know, if I were to give you my five-year um, ambition, I want most of the people in this room in five years to have a, just a default presumption that if I get an email that isn't signed, I don't even open it. It just goes straight to, you know, straight to the trash. You know, we should not be running code and like emails or code. We should not run code when we don't know who it's from. And there are people just all over governments, people all over the world suffering from the ridiculous insecurity of, of email right now. And this is, I'm worried we're going to re, how did we get there? It was because just it was like faculty sending email to faculty and hey, we're all good people. We don't need any security. So I look at the, I mean, by the way, if you, if you notice, um, I do not have the extension manager um, enabled in, in Jupyter. And I don't think I should encourage anybody who uses Jupyter to use the extension manager because we're just opening ourselves up for the same kind of you know, security vulnerabilities uh, that we had before. So anyway, I think <laughs> we know what the risks are, but it's, it's this community, it's the Jupyter community that's, kind of, I think, our only hope in, in fighting this fight. And by the way, I want to turn back on the extension manager when the people who write the extensions, or I can turn it on and see the people who write extensions who actually sign their extensions, and I can see who the person is. I'm happy to, to play in that kind of world of extensions, but not, not if, uh, if you know, somebody can sell their extension to somebody else who wants to use it to infiltrate the, uh, their Bitcoin wallet. So, um, so I, I think that the, there's really a lot of urgency about this. And this is a bit my, my answer, too, about Jupyter Hub. I and mean, Jupyter Hub is, is great. Um, I actually wrote a Pyodide uh, web page uh, to try and illustrate something like in 2019, I think, or something. So uh, I think Pyodide will be great. I think you know, Jupyter Lite will be great. But um, I think the core of Jupyter is still you know, Python from python.org and the desktop functionality of, of, of Jupyter. And I have no idea what people are going to do on mobile. You know, I, people will do what they do. I, they'll figure out something. But if we can't support the core with desktop, and we can't make it just one-click install, one-click run, um, and make it accessible to people the, the way they're used to using um, um, computer applications, we're going to lose uh, this, this amazing position we've got right now. So let's not, let's not drop, uh, let's not let that happen. Thank you. Thank you.